And by way of introduction, I'm Andrea Hunt, partner at BDO, and I lead our national service charge accounting business. We typically arrange these sessions about three to four times a year. So your feedback and videos and ideas for future topics will be really, really welcome after today's event. Before our panel discussion begins, I'd like to make you aware that all attendees are mute for the duration of the session. So we welcome your comments and questions to the panel, which you can submit using the Q&A function in the black control box at the bottom of your screen. Please note this webinar is being recorded. I'd like to welcome our presenters, Louis Dockery and Sophie Brown. Louis and Sophie have got significant experience in fraud risk management, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you. So I'm gonna hand over to Louis now. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us at uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, just a brief introduction from myself. Um, I'm Louis Dockery, and uh, I've been working in the world of counter fraud and counter corruption for about uh, nine years now, or over nine years. Uh, specialising in all elements of fraud risk management from the proactive side, so preventing fraud all the way to when it does unfortunately go wrong and it does go wrong, to actually investigating fraud and assisting clients taking uh, matters to prosecution. Um, I have uh, quite a, a wide experience from uh, financial institutions, but generally speaking, we work a lot with um, you know, private organisations as well as uh, NGOs and not-for-profit organisations. Uh, I'm an accredited counts fraud specialist and uh, work across many areas as discussed and I'm also an accredited uh, EU trainer. Uh, so I deliver all the uh, counts fraud work for the European Commission and uh, European Railways Agency. I'll hand over to Sophie to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sophie Brown and I work um, with Louis Dockery doing exactly the same pretty much, working on a variety of clients and not-for-profit charities and some private institutions as well, um, working with them to perform fraud risk assessments, but also um, not just proactive, but reactive um, as well. So when things go wrong, working out what's happened and if it needs to be taking it to court to, for prosecution and sanctions. Um, I'm a certified fraud examiner and I'm an accredited counter fraud specialist. Excellent, thank you, Sophie. Um, much like Chris Whitty, we'll be, uh, we may have to say our uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully it will all go smoothly. Um, so yeah, this presentation is on the changing landscape of fraud. Uh, and obviously fraud being uh, quite a pressing issue at the moment. Uh, we'd like to share our experiences with yourselves and hopefully, you know, spark something. Uh, you know, you may come away from this presentation thinking maybe I want to focus on a certain area uh, that may be more exposed to fraud now that we are working in this new way. So really this presentation we'll be looking at, uh, we'll be conducting a quick refresher on fraud um, so that we remind ourselves of what the offences are, why people actually go about committing fraud, because in understanding why people commit fraud will be in a better position to prevent it. And then we'll lend some context as to what the magnitude of the issue actually is. And is this something we need to prioritize? And then hopefully some stuff at the end of what can we take away from uh, this session? What can I do after this presentation to make sure that we are in the best possible situation? Next slide, please. So what is fraud? Here is a basic definition of fraud which holds true for most countries. Um, so fraud can be defined as an act of deception with the intention to make a gain for oneself or another or expose someone else to the risk of loss. And there are a few key elements which are essential for proving fraud, which are dishonesty and the intention to make a gain. Next slide, please. So the Fraud Act 2006 is the primary piece of legislation, which is the law in the UK, it excludes Scotland, where it's still a common law offence. Um, here are the three main offences under the Fraud Act, um, which we focus on in our daily work. Um, so fraud rep false representation is essentially where somebody tells a lie in order to make a gain for themselves. And this could be simply as somebody inflating an expense claim or somebody who's stolen somebody else's identity in an identity theft and using that to falsely represent themselves. Failing to disclose. This is where a person fails to disclose any information to a third party where they are under a legal duty to do so. So this could be perhaps getting a car insurance 
um, quote where somebody withholds a particular part of information which in fact actually results in them making a gain for themselves and causing a, a loss to the um, insurance company. And abusive position. So this is where a person occupies a position of trust or where they are expected to safeguard financial interests of another person or confidential information and they abuse that position in order to facilitate a fraud to occur. And at the bottom there, once again, it requires that the person must have acted dishonestly. So to prove that the person knew what they were doing was wrong and they've acted with the intention of making a gain for themselves or anyone else or inflicting a loss or even just a risk of a loss on another. Next slide, please. So now let's consider why do people commit fraud? Next slide, please. So here we have the fraud diamond on the screen. If we focus just on the top triangle bit there, so um, opportunity, pressure and rationalisation, this was created by um, Professor Donald Cressy in the 1970s, where he believed that there were three key elements every single time a fraud occurred, so that there would have to be an opportunity presented to a person, um, rationalisation, so what would that person tell themselves that what they were doing was okay, and what was the internal voice to themselves. And the pressure, what sort of external pressures was somebody facing in order to force them to commit the crime? And um, the malice and challenge part is an extra part which we've added to the bottom, and that's to reflect, I guess, a more current landscape of fraud. Donald Cressy wrote, um, uh, came up with the notion of the fraud triangle in the 1970s, however, I guess in terms of technology and cyber and how connected the world is now, um, malice and challenge reflects that and sort of maybe the um, problems and issues which we might face today, which may not have been considered back in the 1970s. So malice and challenge can be people who just out of challenging themselves or wanting to try, where they might hack in to organisations which might have a lot of valuable information or just trying to see whether they can get in, not so much to commit fraud, but to disrupt things. So that's that's a factor to um, consider when looking at your organisation and whether your controls are in place to mitigate the risk of perhaps cyber and technology type frauds. And we'll be revisiting um, the fraud triangle in more detail later on um, and how COVID-19 has sort of increased those risks for you. Next slide, please. So now we'll come on to the actual magnitude of the issue. And obviously fraud is unfortunately a, a, an endemic uh, type of crime and it actually does account for uh, more than 50% of reported crime in the United Kingdom, certainly. And that's a combination of fraud and cyber enabled fraud. Uh, so we'll, we'll categorize that in uh, sort of one lump. So it is a significant issue. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have the fraud iceberg. Now, we appreciate that this is perhaps a, a crude uh, example of, as to how fraud actually looks. Um, this is sort of devised from a number of studies. Um, and obviously a lot of this is uh, perhaps finger in the air stuff to try and determine what actually gets reported and what doesn't. But in our experience, this does somewhat ring true to uh, reality. So it's estimated about 20% of fraud actually goes actually is reported so reported to action fraud uh, reported to the police uh, or other authorities then about 40 percent of fraud is identified but goes unreported so that could be because the person doesn't know who to report to they're nervous that reporting such uh, matters may blow back onto them uh, and they have concerns it could be that they're not entirely sure and so would rather not report it and let someone else go ahead and do so. And then finally, we have about 40% of fraud, which actually just goes undetected. Um, and that is obviously expected with something of a, a surreptitious nature, uh, such as fraud. I mean, part of it is that it's discreet and under the radar. Obviously, the more concerning element of this uh, iceberg is the 40% that is reported, uh, that is identified but goes unreported. And really, it's uh, something that we can do better in uh, enabling the people we work with to uh, you know, go above the precipice and actually report their concerns. 
it's actually surprising. Uh, myself and Sophie actually started our careers working in uh, NHS counter fraud. And you'd be surprised as to just uh, delivering a few awareness sessions, how the volume of fraud reporting actually increases significantly. And actually this issue manifests itself in uh, one investigation whereby a, a lady, an office manager was stealing a uh, copier toner. So she was ordering a vast amount of copier toner and selling it on eBay. Um, and when we were interviewing witnesses or when the investigators were interviewing witnesses in this case, um, it was identified, well, they identified that some uh, gentleman was in the car park and said, I often saw her loading up copier toner into the back of her car uh, in the evenings, but never really thought anything of it. Now, obviously, that's a suspicious activity, but because he's potentially not as aware of the risk of fraud, he didn't actually go ahead and report it. It's also worth noting here with the, the sort of magnitude of the issue is that there's only one police force in the UK who actually have fraud in its ten, top 10 priorities, and that's the City of London Police. So they actually have a, an economic crime uh, unit within there. And obviously this is over and above the Serious Fraud Office. Um, so the resources really aren't there. Uh, the authorities may not be there to help. So once uh, someone reports a matter to action fraud, um, they may report it to a local constabulary, um, but there is a good chance that if it doesn't reach uh, about half a million pound loss and doesn't share the modus operandi, so the method of which the fraud was committed with another reported fraud, i.e. indicating uh, organised crime, then the matter will likely not be picked up. So it's really important that we actually focus on prevention rather than uh, reactive services. So that is really the state of play. Next slide, please. Now, that was the current land fraud landscape, and it's only been made worse with the impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, to, to, we've not seen as much uh, like a, a massive increase in reported fraud, but we've started to see more cases being referred to us. So the matter that the issue is uh, increasing. Now, if we take a case example of Hurricane Katrina, um, it's a really perfect example of how uh, professional fraudsters and also legitimate individuals who had previously not committed crime uh, use a disaster in order to commit fraud or their backs against the wall and they end up committing fraud and we'll touch on that actually a little bit more detail with respect to the fraud triangle. So in the midst of that disaster the US actually created a task force dedicated to uh, fraud uh, in relation to disasters and as part of that work for that isolated event, um, they actually charged 1,400 individuals with fraud offences with losses amounting to $600 million. That's actually a vast amount of money. And in those cases, a lot of those uh, issues were to do with fraudulent insurance claims in order to uh, make ends meet potentially for some businesses. But if we see in that isolated event, $600 million, uh, that's, a, that's a hell of a lot of money. So if we use the UK as an example now, because we have some facts and figures, we had a 400% increase in reported phishing scams and procurement frauds. This, is, this was reported to action fraud. We also had uh, the reports to government where it was estimated that 3.5 billion was potentially being uh, lost to fraud uh, in, for the furlough scheme. Uh, so that's people who don't actually exist. That's people who actually didn't start employment. So potentially were uh, employed and then fired uh, before that cutoff period for furlough. And then we also have the business grant loans, so the bounce back loans. And already it's been estimated that 15 to 26 billion is being lost to either uh, fraud, organized crime or default. Now, obviously there's a wide margin there, but there is scope that potentially fraud is going on and could go undetected unless work is done. So we really do have a challenge on our hands and we need to be live to the situation. Next slide, please. So if we look at the impact now, obviously we are all quite familiar with this because what we thought was temporary, I guess uh, almost 12 months ago has now become uh, permanent or, or semi-permanent is that we now have a situation whereby potentially we have reduced staffing levels, again, due to furlough and pressures on the business. 
We're also redeploying staff to other areas. So people are unfamiliar with certain practices and so are having to learn on the job. And as a result of that, we've seen increases in fraud um, in other areas. So we've seen an increase in uh, bank mandate fraud. We've seen an increase in recruitment and pre-employment fraud. Um, how are we able to validate people's licenses, uh, passports, uh, their background if we can't actually meet in person? So an increase in procurement fraud now that there's more pressures on organisations to procure at volume potentially with new systems they have to implement. And we'll go again into a lot more detail on later slides, uh, looking at the potential matters you're, you're potentially facing. Next slide, please. So here we are going back to the forward triangle. So here we'll focus on the triangle. And uh, just to obviously reiterate what Sophie said, we have the rationalization, which is what the forcer tells himself in order to justify their actions. We have the pressure, which is uh, the external uh, pressures that uh, maybe make a fraudster commit fraud. And then we have the opportunity or perceived opportunity uh, that means a fraudster will actually go ahead and commit fraud. Now we'll go into a little bit more detail as to, to what goes on here, but what we're seeing is that these little uh, parts of the triangle are actually becoming larger and therefore people are more inclined to commit fraud. And we're seeing more people who are, I guess you'd argue, say previously honest individuals who now go about committing fraud. And I'll just touch on a, a, a sort of brief example to illustrate this. Um, it's a little bit of a basic example, but it's uh, in a situation whereby you leave work and there's a five pound note on the floor. Uh, do you take it? And most people probably would take it. Obviously, the correct answer, or if there is a correct answer, is to hand that in to whoever uh, is around. So I guess the, the ticket station, uh, the, the ticket office at the train station. That's an example of how we can bend and flex our integrity in order to justify our actions. And in that case, it's very basic. It's a five pound note. But as we'll go into a few examples, we'll see how actually how this bending and flexing actually um, actually changes the way we think about uh, economic crime. Next slide, please. So if we focus first on opportunities, now I touched on this uh, a little bit earlier, but we're seeing a significant increase in opportunities for fraudsters. With the move to remote working, we're now in a, situ in a situation whereby we're not working in teams as much and uh, teams aren't actually articulating when they have concerns about specific areas, meaning that suspicious activities that would have previously been identified with a two-second chat or a two-second check with a colleague are actually now going unchallenged. Um, and we've seen that a little bit within finance departments, particularly around uh, smaller um, non for non-regular suppliers. We've seen obviously significant changes to working practices. Um, and unfortunately with the sort of rapid change we had to implement those changes, we weren't able to fully test them and identify where the pitfalls uh, were potentially located. And so that's allowed fraudsters to uh, manipulate their way into uh, systems and actually make a game for themselves. And along with the remote working, as I've already mentioned, it's just the physical distance. Uh, the physical distance has enabled fraudsters to um, operate even more surreptitiously. I think we, we have to remember we're now operating in a world that fraudsters have been operating in uh, for the last 10 years. They're very used to committing uh, fraud electronically using phone, email, um, a, a laptop. This is their domain. Uh, again, that ties into the psychology of working from home. We're perhaps a little bit more distracted now, now we're working from home. Those with children having to um, think about childcare, uh, thinking about you know dealing with uh, relatives. Um, obviously the psychology of actually working from home for a year, particularly if you're someone who isn't as fortunate with uh, their home setup for working remotely, that may obviously uh, lead to someone not taking as um, 
strict uh, view on risk management and may perhaps things slip under the radar because we're potentially too comfortable uh, in some scenarios. And also another issue is the high operational demands. Um, when we're working in areas uh, you know, such as property management, the demand doesn't, doesn't uh, obviously go down, the, the demands remain high. And so the operational demands plus with the potential of um, fewer people within the business, uh, people being furloughed means there's a lot more work for uh, those individuals. And so we're focused on our task at hand and we're not potentially looking wider at um, what would have previously been an obvious red flag, but uh, now is something that actually slips be, uh, below the radar. Um, and again, for the individual opportunity, so this is um, uh, for, I guess, more personalized uh, views of, of economic crime. So looking more so at the fraudster, it's again, the physical distance as already mentioned, but also technically adept. Uh, the fraudster is very technically savvy and uh, they know how to use these tools uh, better than we do because as mentioned uh, they've been doing this for a long time. Next slide please. So now we'll look at COVID-19 impacts on the rationalisation so what does somebody tell themselves to justify their behaviour? So as Louis mentioned COVID-19 has changed working patterns or perhaps having to react to situations which you may not be familiar with or staff might not be familiar with, which could result in working longer hours. Um, so the top one here, I've been doing overtime unpaid. Somebody may feel disgruntled in the fact that they've had to put in a lot of time to react to the changes brought about COVID-19 and not been um, paid for the work. Um, or I need the money more than you do. We're going to look at this slightly more on pressures. This can link to pressure as well, element of the triangle, that maybe there were two people in the family that were bringing in two salaries, but perhaps one person isn't able to work at the moment for whatever reason. And there's only one salary coming in now, which could heavily impact a family. So somebody may feel that they need the money more than the organisation does and feeling it wouldn't make too much of an impact. And you should have checked or asked the question. And I think this um, follows on from the changing working patterns that if we're not in physical proximity to somebody, perhaps those checks are being overlooked or there's less oversight or scrutiny. So people are able to loan work a lot more now. And if somebody feels that they're not being checked up upon, then they feel it's not their problem. Um, and nobody got hurt and this is not only the most common response that we see when we've um, performed interviews under caution for somebody's motives for committing the fraud. They um, feel that because fraud is a victimless crime, that because nobody got hurt, it justifies the behavior for committing the offense. Next slide, please. And then finally, we, as, as mentioned by Sophie, we touch on the motivations and pressures. Uh, again, that ties into the rationalization so obviously the issues that we've seen is obviously a vast amount of people put on furlough. So there's immense pressure on uh, a household. So there's uh, a loss of income. There's uh, family pressures or again brought on by potentially having to look after relatives, um, children at home for long extended periods of time. There's obviously a significant amount of debt that people may have accrued during that time. Um, and just general loss of employment, so loss of opportunities to actually uh, gain work during this time. Uh, because in the reality is a professional fraudster will always find a reason to commit fraud. So if we think of Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can, or if we think of Bernie Madoff, um, they're going to commit fraud. Uh, where the increase in fraud occurs is the legitimate person or the, the, the previously honest person now um, going about uh, committing fraud. Um, so these are the sort of motivations uh, we have seen. And I know that during the pandemic, there was actually an article very recently whereby fraudsters were offering uh, subscription courses on how to commit fraud. So that is something that's uh, come about because people are so desperate to make money, they're now willing to even learn how to commit economic crime. So all these parts of the triangle have got bigger. Um, and so fraud is more likely to occur. 
Unfortunately, quite a lot of the people we work with are of initially the view that uh, it can't possibly happen to us. But the reality is uh, it can, and uh, there is a good chance that there will be a, a decent attempt at it. Next slide, please. So what might you encounter at your organisation? Next slide, please. Mandate fraud. This is a type of fraud which has evolved over time and is continually evolving. And um, it can be defined as a fraudulent request to change banking details in order to divert regular payments or to create new payments. And this doesn't only relate to supplier payments, existing supplier payments, it can also be employees as well. And we've seen a big increase of that recently, whereby um, employees, um, where, whereby you change your bank account um, via HR, for example, um, a fraudster could purport to be yourself or an employee at your organisation and contact HR in order to try and get salary payments. And even though it doesn't appear that that's um, very, very a la large amounts of money, potentially every month, it's still worthwhile for the fraudster. And they'll attempt everywhere where they see there's an opportunity or perhaps a, a lack of controls there. Um, and also fraudsters are employed exploiting changes in reporting lines and as Louis mentioned the increased absence cover um, and remote working just as a chance to catch somebody who might not be familiar with the controls in the area they're working with um, or somebody who who's remote working whereby that secondized check isn't readily as available so perhaps the red flag will be um, sort of as Louis said fly under the radar there um, and that, that can be potentially quite catastrophic as well. We had a case recently whereby um, a client of ours and a long-standing supplier of theirs were both defrauded by the fraudster. So a fraudster had spoofed email addresses from the supplier and from our client. So the accounts payable at our client had a spoofed email address by the fraudster and the supplier contact had a spoofed email address um, created by the fraudster. And um, the fraudster managed to create this long-standing email trail backwards and forwards between legitimate people and then sometimes the false email addresses. And it resulted in providing quite a believable supporting or um, well, supporting evidence in order to facilitate banking um, details. And this was a very, very large amount of money that they were trying to divert into this bank account. Unfortunately, the bank account details were changed within our client system and it goes to show that the fraudsters are very, very smart. Um, and when we're working in our normal roles every day, being busy, et cetera, it's easy to see the small mistakes and, and overlook them and potentially, well, and I guess put trust in the people we're working with and our suppliers. And next slide, please. And invoice fraud, That's this is another really large one which we've seen this year. There's been an approximately 75% increase in attempted invoices, um, invoice fraud since the pandemic started. It's important to be mindful that the fraudster may be somebody external to the organisation whereby you've had no interaction with them before or they've had no interaction with the, with the organisation before but it may also be a long-standing supplier which you have and this could be invoicing for services which haven't been provided or inflating or just adding costs and this this could be I guess the opportunity has increased for this to occur because for for the restrictions which COVID-19 has brought about so perhaps less site visits less scrutiny less oversight and um, perhaps there has to be more a, a higher element of trust in the suppliers we're working with and conversations that Louis and I have had with clients in the past year, clients have said they've been they've had to rely a lot more on trust with the suppliers and contractors they have in place, and um, it's important to sort of consider whether your controls for contracts management and oversight are still appropriate, considering all the restrictions which have been in place in the last year. And because they've changed quite a lot, we've been in and out of lockdown, there's been different things we've been allowed to do, et cetera. And it's um, taking a sort of a look at those controls in an objective view to see whether they're still appropriate for what you're trying to achieve. Also, 
um, it's not always the really large costs that are vulnerable to invoice fraud or the big the big invoices which you see. It can also be the smaller invoices which come in just for a small amount each month or with whatever it may be and these ones are more likely to go undetected however over time they can add up and it can be um, particularly devastating to an organization next slide please thank you uh, and also just to add on to what sophie uh, mentioned it's one of those things it's death by a thousand cuts um one of the longest running frauds was uh I believe she was a bank teller in an American bank and she'd been committing fraud for about, uh, I think almost 30 years. And she was just uh, taking uh, not even a thousand dollars a month. Um, it just slipped under the radar, but over time, obviously it, uh, it went into the millions. Uh, so just something to bear in mind. So uh, here we touch on uh, cyber enabled fraud because I guess we'd be remiss if we didn't actually touch on it. So obviously, um, the cyber element is sort of taking over the traditional uh, method of committing fraud, i.e. the con man uh, going into a business purporting to be uh, someone they're not. Um, and it is the means by which people actually go about committing fraud. And we have a number of trends uh, that are obviously emerging, which were obviously uh, matters that were uh, on the increase prior to the pandemic, but have uh, taken um, a sharp rise. So we're looking at um, hacking, so socially engineering individuals and uh, emails uh, to spoof uh, people you would generally work with. Now that would obviously be used to commit something later on, uh, such as uh, bank mandate fraud. And actually this is becoming increasingly sophisticated. Uh, I actually took a quick look at my junk email box to see what was actually captured within there to, to get a sense as to what's going on, so the failed attempts, uh, as it were. Um, and I had some emails which were spoofing my wife's Yahoo address, and it was spot on, except it was .co.uk. Um, and you think uh, that's some impressive machine learning they must be using in order to try and tailor emails specifically for you and then to obtain uh, the necessary email to spoof the necessary email in order to get you to click on it. So it is becoming increasingly sophisticated. We also have the risk of extortion. Um, so ransomware uh, being uh, actually used to extract funds from, a, from an organization because you may have valuable data. And most organizations have valuable data and yourselves uh, will have information about customers, banking information, for example, you have potentially have um, other useful information such as employee data. In fact, recently we have uh, the video game developer CD Projekt Red, who um, actually had an instance of ransomware and the fraudsters basically said that if you don't give us uh, the money, we will leak uh, information about your intellectual property. Um, they refused and uh, the information uh, we understand has subsequently been sold um, on the dark web. But something to be aware of is making sure that we have the correct IT infrastructure to uh, prevent such uh, matters going on. And, and I won't profess to be uh, an IT or cyber expert, uh, but it's uh, the common issues we do see is that certain systems are not compatible with the network you're working and therefore the system doesn't operate as expected. Um, so it's just making sure that we have the right systems in place. And then traditional sort of computer viruses, malware, spyware, um, and really sort of one of the key enablers for that, again, as mentioned, is not having the right protocols in place to make sure uh, things are patched properly. Uh, the awareness to staff, making sure that they don't click on anything erroneously. Um, and we always have the, the weak password uh, risk. So you know, using the same password for 50 different websites. And I think we've all been guilty of that at some point in our lives. Um, I think it's just human nature, isn't it? Um, but it's making sure that we have those uh, right controls in place and just think about, um, yeah, traditional good um, cybersecurity and raising awareness of that. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, obviously, we've mentioned those sort of three sort of headline fraud risks. Um, 
and uh, you know how they're on the increase but a lot of organizations will say that's all well and good but you know we have the controls in place to prevent that from happening and the reality is is that with the frauds that we investigate traditionally i would say that yes most organizations have those controls in place um and they would be the expected level of control however they do fail um and i'd say that the majority of time they fail due to um, poor implementation or the staff not knowing how to implement that control uh, properly. Um, Frauds has coined a term called hacking the human. Uh, I can't recall who, who exactly it was that coined the term, uh, whether it's one someone who got caught or not. But basically the control environment tends to be fairly robust um, in pre-COVID times. Uh, and basically the best way of committing fraud is actually just getting to the person who sits behind those controls and to get them to bypass it. Um, and so that we have to be uh, aware of the people we work with, make sure they know why a control is in place. In fact, I did an uh, investigation shortly before COVID actually in relation to an expenses fraud. And it transpired um, that uh, an employee was basically putting travel and hotels for, well, personal hotels and personal travel onto a corporate credit card and had been doing so for a significant amount of time. And I spoke to the manager who was approving them and he was a very, very senior person in the business and his view was that he thought it was finance who checked the validity of the expense claim. Um, he was not aware they simply checked for compliance to the process and that it was uh, their responsibility well, his responsibility to check whether they are genuine claims. And so it goes to show that even in a business whereby we think uh, everyone should know, uh, the reality is I'm sure most of us work within finance or a risk-based uh, part of an organisation. And so for us, it's this is all second nature, but we have to remember it's not second nature to everyone. So we need to reinforce those facts as, you know, we have to make sure we apply those controls consistently and think about... Um, the risks wider than our own task. So it's not just focusing on the precise task at hand. And as I mentioned before, um, we fall victim again, because we're uh, too under pressure. So for some of us, um, we have untested control environments because of those changes. And again, the psychology, we're working remotely. And so maybe we don't pay the same attention to certain um, matters. And obviously the assumption that someone else is uh, delivering uh, that check. So someone else along the line who will pick that up. So the, there are myriad reasons. And um, if we can go to the next slide, please. There are certain things we can do in order to uh, you know, manage fraud risk more effectively within our business. So think about when was the last time we actually did a fraud risk assessment or strategic fraud risk assessment what areas of the business actually need to be looked at a little bit more closely and not necessarily thinking just about finance, thinking about potentially HR risk, cyber risk, uh, looking at those areas to make sure that you have uh, the right controls in place to prevent fraud from occurring. Are there investigations or are there reported matters that potentially should have been remediated uh, through either internal HR disciplinary or um, through the courts? Um, You'd be surprised at the number of organisations who simply uh, just have it as a business expense. Now, appreciate that it's not always possible to investigate an inv uh, a matter fully. However, we've got to also think about the um, impact on an organisation if we don't actually go about uh, investigating something. Are we sending the wrong message? Um, is our strategy well defined for combating fraud? Is it effective? Are we actually dedicating sufficient resources to preventing fraud from occurring? Um, how effective are our whistleblowing arrangements? Potentially we need to think wider than fraud, think about uh, other issues that may need to be reported because those issues may also link into an element of economic crime or wider public interest disclosure. Um, have we gone any, uh, undergone any major changes and have those systems been um, actually validated and checked? And obviously, I think we're all in that position, something we uh, need to consider. Um, have we looked at our culture? How are we actually raising awareness of uh, fraud? Um, do we know what to look out for? Is everyone properly trained within those respective areas or are we just focusing on getting the task done at hand, which is often... Um, a slipping point. 
Uh, when was the last time we updated our policies and procedures? And have we communicated all of that properly with all our staff? How do we actually go about reporting a fraud? Do we have a mechanism in place that's effective for actually reporting allegations? And then finally, does uh, do we actually capture intelligence in, a, in an effective way so that we know where the emerging fraud risks are so that we're not uh, catching up to the fraudsters, but we're putting in mechanisms in place to prevent fraud from occurring? So these are all things we can sort of take away and maybe think about how we can maybe better uh, combat economic crime. Next slide, please. And uh, thank you for listening to us. I'll just hand over to Andrea for some sort of closing remarks. That's lovely. Thank you very much to Louis and Sophie. Um, just with a, an eye to the time, we do have one question that's come through. If, if I could just ask um, that question to you, perhaps, Louis. Um, what would you consider to be the best fraud identification method that's come through the panel? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. The, the best method of uh, identifying fraud, really it's, it's a combination of uh, horizon scanning. So looking at what's actually happening elsewhere within the uh, wider economic landscape, but also getting your staff involved um, in sharing their experiences uh, about it. So when are undertaking a fraud risk assessment, not just taking it from the top level, get into work with those people who are operating in the coal phase. That's brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have come to the end of the session. Um, I'd like to thank um, Louis, Sophie, for that great insight today um, and to present and for all of you to attend today as well. Um, if you've got any questions, then please do get in touch and a copy of the recording of the online panel discussion will be sent to you in a few days. Um, so a final comment from me, thank you to all of you um, and hopefully we'll see you very soon, hopefully in person. So thank you very much, everyone.